pay two hundred and seventy. Pay two hundred and seventy per second on that verse.
You guys have had a good afternoon. Maybe got a little nap. I think I slept too good last night. I didn't need a nap this afternoon. And that's all right. I'm just curious if it's going to rain again this evening. I think you can almost wring the water out of the air outside. It's uh, it's that humid. But this morning, <clears throat> maybe the comment the church is responsible for sending more people to hell than any other particular thing. Some say 
that might be too condemning, but I'm afraid it's really too true. And this morning we looked at three attitudes, three attitudes that uh, give weight to that comment. Our attitude toward evangelism, someone else will do it, someone else's job, not my calling. I could just not do that. I'm too shy, uneducated, scared. Uh, I tried it once, they made fun of me. And, and, and it was, you know, that comment got more comments after church. People telling me, yeah, I remember, you know, when I was at the playground, I did this. I tripped going up the steps. But you know what? I got back up and went up the steps again and again and again. So, uh, but, but our attitude toward evangelism is, is we want to leave it for someone else. Secondly, our attitude toward the lost. They're supposed to be saved. They'll get saved. If they get saved, they will start attending. And, well, I don't know that we need that kind. In our church, they got themselves into that mess. Let them get themselves out of it. They knew the consequences going in. We even tried to tell them. And don't you know how busy I am? I just don't have time for that. And our attitude toward church growth. If we if we if we start doing all this, we're going to grow, and then we're going to have to build, and then we're they're going to stain our pews and our walls and our carpet, and 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 basically we make our churches a mecca, a shrine. I think one of the best testimonies for a church has to be that the building is being used and it needs to be updated. It needs to be renovated. It needs a coat of paint. The, the, the carpet washed, the pews clean. What a, what a joyous thing that is. And then of course you look at all the kids. So you have, I don't know where all these kids came from this morning. That's two in a row. I think it's great. I mean, I, I want to tell you, I brag on our little church every chance I get because of the kids that we have. Now, now Jill and I, we've been in some churches, and she'll tell you, they wouldn't put up with it. They just wouldn't. So, you know, it, it, it's interesting that, that you guys, you do. You are a unique and special group, and I don't mean that in a negative way. But that's not the future of our church. I'm going to tell you, those three kids sitting there, that's our church. That one sitting in the middle pew there, that's our church. That's not the future. That is our church. So let, let's start making way now. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus said to them, The righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry? Verse 37, feed you thirsty give you drink? When did we see you a stranger take you in naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick and in prison and come to you? And the king will say unto them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it unto the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto thee, unto me. You did it unto me. The least of these. We, we live in, and I said this morning, the fourth largest Lost nation in the world. Lost nation. And we only have 331, 32 million people. China is the largest with, with almost 2 billion people. India is right behind them. Those two countries make up half of the world's population. I want you to think about that a minute. Half of the world's population. India is primarily uh, Hindu and Muslim. China is atheist. Is atheist. What is our problem in America? What's our problem? Church. We got a problem. We have a mission field right here. And we need to reach it. But we've got to overcome our attitude toward the least of these concerning evangelism, concerning their lostness, and concerning growth. But then, let's get real particular. I think the fourth attitude we have is our attitude toward each other. What do I mean by that? The way we treat each other. And make no mistake, people inside the church hear it and see it, and so do people on the outside. The outsiders looking in. The way we treat each other. The way we talk. We backstab. 
we gossip, walk on when they're down rather than reach out and help them up. How do we treat each other? What did, what did Jesus say? Love each other. What did, what did Jesus say? If your brother's down, help him up. Don't go by and kick him and spit on him. Don't walk by the other side. We see the man on the road to Jericho was helped by a Samaritan of all people. We need to help the Samaritans and we need to be the Samaritans. We see the attitude toward each other and I, I, I will never understand this one. The quest for power within the church. There's no power in the church. I think every one of you sitting here will agree with me. There is no power in the church. You ask any of our deacons, do you want to be a deacon? No, they are called to be a deacon. They just didn't wake up one morning and go, gee, I think I want to be a deacon. I'm going to go tell that preacher I need to be a deacon. I'm being called as a deacon. I've never known a true deacon that would say that. Being a deacon doesn't have power. Being the treasurer doesn't have power. Being a Sunday school teacher doesn't have power. Being a director doesn't have power. I mean, do you fire anybody in the church? I can look at Jerry and say, you played that song three times wrong. I'm firing you. Well, you know what Jerry would say? He'd say, good, here's the guitar. You do it. No, man, I love it. He makes me feel good. I wonder what happened if I got up here and got, you know, into my sermon and messed up and would start all over again. Wouldn't that be cool? No. But it, but, but it shows, hey, we're human. But the way we treat each other, there's no power in being a Sunday school teacher. There's no power in being an usher. Listen, there's no power in being the preacher. I can't fire anybody. I can't tell anybody, well, you just don't need to come back. I can lead in, 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 in business of the church and maybe a direction to go, but that's it. Why would you even want the power? And what is the power over a small group of people? I, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Power in the church, I believe, is just a, a, a tool that the devil uses to bring disunity and division. And people on the outside see that. I have been to churches before where they need to change their name to Fuss Baptist Church. They fight more than anyone else and about some of the silliest things. What do you think it tells the, the community when we fuss about the color of the carpet, the color of the pews, the color of the paint, what goes on the floor, what, what, who parks where? Are we going to have a pastor's parking? They had a pastor's parking in Texarkana. They, and they got me a, a, a sign that said pastor's parking because I had the knee replacements and I was about two or three years where I was real crippled up. And, and they thought they would, they would do that and, and, and be nice. And, and it was really cool because they put pastor's parking and they put a fish on there. And where the eyes were, it was, cross, it was a cross. And I said, great, we got a cross-eyed fish <laughs> for their pastor. You know, those, but, but I parked there because I, that was my parking place, I guess. But for years, I parked out away from the church. You know, what, what is the deal with the power? And that's what the people are seeing. The ones that are, the, 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 the outside sees our attitude toward each other. The ones that want to stir up the pot, that seek controversy. Their ministry is the ministry of controversy. And the outside sees that. And you know what the outside says? I'll tell you what the outside says because I have heard it personally. Preacher, I want to tell you, if that's what being a Christian and going to church is all about, I ain't going to have any part of it. I can go to work and get that. One guy said, I can go home and get that. One guy said, I can go to my community civil, civic clubs. And can I tell you my response? That's not what being a Christian is about. It's not. Unfortunately, people act that way. But our attitude toward each other. And you know, one of the other attitudes that, 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 we, that we see is the expectations that we put on new believers when we don't even do them ourselves. Now, I'm not saying here, again, this is a generality of what I've seen over six churches in the last 30 years, 35 years. I'm getting old. 
This is what I've seen. This is the attitudes that I've seen. A new Christian. Well, now you need to get you a King James Bible and you need to read it every day and you need to be at church every time the door is open. And, and, and we love, some churches love new believers because they're so anxious to get in. We load them up on every committee, every job that is possible, and we burn them out in the first year. And they look around and go, well, what are you doing? It's the very thing Jesus told in his denunciation of the scribes and the Pharisees when he said, you will go over hill and dale to win one convert, and when you do, you'll make them twice a son of perdition by what you load on them, and you won't, you'll put a burden on them so heavy, you won't even lift one finger to help them. And if we're not going to do it ourselves, I will never ask anybody in church to do anything that I won't do myself that I haven't done myself. Now, there are some things I can't do, and I'll ask someone to do it, you know, like like Damien or Keegan or Bryce, because they're young, and they can get up and down a whole lot easier than I can. But, but what I'm saying is our attitude toward each other in the church. What is it? Love your brother. Love your brother as yourself. Sometimes I think we do a better job of loving our enemy and we do love in our brother. And I want you to know something. What we do inside this building is a mirror reflection to everybody on the outside. And let me tell you, what's even worse than that is when we go to the restaurant, when we go to the coffee shop, when we're on the aisle at Walmart or, or at Thriftway, when we're out in the public and we start running someone down, other people hear that that are not believers or, or not going to church for that very reason. Wow, that hurts. That hurts. And I think Jesus is basically saying, churches, you need an attitude adjustment. You need an attitude adjustment. And we need to look at that. Fifthly, well, we, we looked at our, our, our attitude toward evangelism, attitude toward the lost, Attitude toward growth, attitude toward each other, and fifthly, these last two are going to be very personal. Our attitude toward God's Word. Our attitude toward God's Word. We, we sit in here and we hold this, this book up and, and this is God's Word. It's my God. I, it, it is. And what is our attitude toward God's life? If God's word is so important, if it's the bread that you eat, the water you drink, if it is the very life that you live, why do we not read it every day? Why do we not? Why do we not study it consistently? Why do we not know God's word? How can we have not hid his word in our heart? Because hiding his word in our heart will keep us from sinning against him. How come we don't make his word a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path? That's Psalm 119, by the way. Do we read it, study it, and, and, and maybe even, <laughs> even harder yet, do we obey it? Do we obey it? Is it? Do we consider God's word the inerrant, infallible truth without error in the originals? Do we? Now, if you're going to say, this book has got errors in it, I will say, yes, you're right. It is translations of the original. In the original, there are no, well, see, there you go. How do you know what's, what's right and what's not? Because the oldest manuscripts we have go back 2,800 years to the time of Isaiah, 7th century B.C., and we have found fragments, fragments of that book of Isaiah, and we have translated it in comparison to what we have of the book of Isaiah, and it is almost spot on. Spot on. You know, we put the Bible under more rigorous exam than we do the works of Shakespeare, the works of Plato, the works of Aristotle, of anything else, any other literary work that is out there. And I don't hear anybody doubting their word, but yet with God's word, we will. Now, is it in error? Is it infallible? Yes. Then why don't we live it? Now, I got a real problem. 
problem with our convention with this one. Because this is one of the very things. This is at the heart of what we're coming up against. Satan uses new gimmicks, but it's still the same old thing that he's used for years. And he's been able to divide group after group after group. And yet Southern Baptist is the only denomination that has yet to split because of the, of the inerrant infallibility we hold to God's word. But can I tell you something? Sometimes I think we are professional Christian atheists. Yeah, <laughs> that got some eyebrows up. What do I mean by that? We believe God's word, but only to a point. Only to a point. And we will believe it when it's convenient for us. And this is exactly what we're seeing in our world today. It's just like Adam in the garden, and it's just like Jesus in the wilderness. Did God really say? And you see today, with the, with the heretic teachings that are going around, Really, God just wants you to be happy. And if being this way makes you happy, then it's okay. You know, I have read this book from cover to cover almost 30 times consecutively, and I have not found that in his text anywhere. Anywhere. But yet when it's a matter of convenience, I've had some discussions with people about THC, hemp oil, and marijuana. God made all the plants, so it must be good for our body. Listen, God made poison ivy, didn't he? No, I don't think God made poison ivy. I think God made an ivy, and as Satan corrupted man and the fall of man, that was corrupted. And I know people say that that, that Noah took the hemp or whatever to the ark, and there's, oh, there, let me tell you, there's a lot of discussion out there. I disagree with them. I don't think it is, and I think it's one of those where Jesus could come back just like he did the Sadducees. You're ignorant. You don't know Scripture. Now, that's a bold statement to make in front of you and on YouTube and on Facebook, but I can back it up. I can. So when we look at those, at those things, we need to decide what we are with God's word. And the only way you're going to know the infallibility, the inerrancy, is read it. Study it. Hear it taught on, on, on the right way, the right level. There's heretics that are out there. Believe me, there are. I don't think I'm one of them. I think I'm one of these old dinosaur, died in the wool, Southern Baptist. And I am what I am, and I make no apologies for it. And whenever we have to apologize for God's word, we've already made our first mistake right there. What is our attitude God, towards God's word? Listen, I've got it, and I know where it's at if I need it. And that's when we go to it, is when we need it. When Sunday morning comes, I've got to bring my Bible with me, but that's about the only time it's opened. And, and if I get to bind and somebody says, you know, it's in Scripture, go look here, and we'll go to it. Or we need to, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. You know, I don't, under, I don't understand people. You have God's word in front of you, and if you do not consult it on a daily, consistent basis, you're going to have things come up in your life, and it's going to make you stumble. Write it down. It will make you stumble. So why do we only refer to it when we get in a jam? Or when we want to try and prove our point, oh, I remember this scripture, and, 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 it, and it says it's not good for man to be alone, so he needs to have a woman, so I got me a woman. Wasn't the same one as last week, may not be the one as next week, but I got a woman because scripture says. And again, you're ignorant. You do not know scripture. Actually, I think it's mistaken, but some translations say ignorant. I like that better. Because I think that's what it is. It is an ignorance of Scripture. How can we say ignorance of the law is no excuse? And yet we can be ignorant of God's Word and say, I didn't know I was there, God. My lands, I'll bet I've got 30 Bibles in my house. I can never say that to God. i got way too many of them. Our attitude toward each other, our attitude toward God's Word. And you know, when our attitude toward God's Word is wrong, 
our attitude toward our faith is going to be wrong. What do I mean? Do we believe God will do all he said he will do? There is a word for this, and it's called practical atheism. We believe in God. We just don't believe God can do this. Did God really cause the Red Sea to split? Did God really make the walls of Jericho fall down? Did David really kill that giant? Was he really a giant? Did God really create the world in six days? Was there really a flood that wiped everybody out and only ate? Was there really even an ark and all those animals were on there? That's practical atheism. You will believe parts of God but not all of God's word. And we went through a period in, 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 in our church history, we've gone through two or three of them, where that has come up. And it goes back to the inerrant infallibility, inerrancy and infallibility of God's word. And you know what? People say, do you really believe that? <laughs> yeah, I do. I, I went in less than Pam just got back from the ark encounter. If you've not been to the Ark Encounter, you need to go. I'm, 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 I'm serious. It is a trip that, that I think will change your biblical view on the Bible. Amen. I'm, I'm, I mean, when you stand in front of an Ark that was built according to the measurement specifications of what God's Word said. Les, when you sit there at that, that bow and you look up and you just continue looking up, that's a long way up, isn't it? And that thing's 450 feet long, and you go inside and see the three decks, and you look at it, and then the explanation of the animal and, and, and the biological genesis that's there. It's amazing, and you think, well, yeah, that, that's possible. When people say, you really believe that? Yes, I do. It's called faith. I do believe God will do all that he said. He created the world, and he said one day, and he destroyed the world, and then the recreation went with Adam, or with Noah and, and his family. And I believe Abraham at 100 years old and Sarah at 90, fathered a child and raised a child. I, I believe that. I believe that God said his son for me, that I can have forgiveness of sin. And I believe Jesus died on that cross. I believe Jesus was put in that grave. I believe Jesus kicked that stone out of the way so he could get out of that grave. It was a borrowed tomb because he didn't need it but for a short time. He was seen by over 500 at one time. He, was, he ascended to heaven between two angels with a promise that he would return in like manner. I believe it. You cannot shake my belief on that. That's my faith. And not only that, I believe God all the time. I have seen God do too many miracles. Too many miracles in my life and in my lifetime. I can't deny him. Let me tell you, Jill being my wife for 19 years, that's not a miracle. The way we came together is a miracle. I believe that. I believe God brought us together for a purpose. I believe God has a purpose for everything. And I believe sometimes that purpose is hard to understand. But I believe if he leads you to it, he's going to take you through it. I have too many testimonies in my life not to believe that. But when people on the outside hear that doubt, hear that doubt, well, you're no different than I am. I believe there's a God. I believe just there's a lot of different ways to get to it. Well, I don't know, because, you know, the Bible says there's only one way. Well, let me tell you, if you don't believe God's word is the infallible, inerrant word of truth, then they can pick you apart. Who says it's the only way? If you don't think that Bible is true completely, then I can believe anything I want, and they're right. And I'm going to tell you, if you don't read God's word, study God's word, and know God's word, and do God's word, you're never going to be able to show them what the truth really is. And when people see the attitude we have 
toward faith. Toward faith. Now, I'm not a name it and claim it professor. Professor, not professor like a teacher, but one who professes. I'm not one of them. I believe Jesus, I read it this morning, Jesus said, if you, believe, if you say to that mulberry tree, be uprooted here and cast into the sea, it'll happen. It'll happen. And I believe that it can happen if it's what his will is. But I don't know God's whole will. I know what his will is for right now. I know what his will is for, for, for where I'm at, but I don't know what his will is for the future. And I don't know what a mulberry bush being cast into the sea is going to change anybody anyway. But if God said you need to pray and do it, then pray and do it. But if God's not telling you to pray and do it and someone else is, that's probably not God. It's probably not God. And you know people want to hang you up on your faith. Well, if your faith is so great, how come they're sick? How come they died? How come they're in the hospital? How come they split up? How come? And you know people can pick, 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 pick. But I will tell you this. My answer to that is, I'm not God. I don't know what he's got in mind and what he's doing. And I don't know the whole story behind that. I don't know. But I know. This one thing I know. Jesus loves me. And he's taking care of me to this point, And he's going to take care of me tomorrow, whatever it may bring. People need to see that in our faith. Not the doubt in our faith. Not the doubt in God's word. Not our doubt in how we treat other people. Not our doubt of our church growing. Not our doubt in, in how we, we treat the lost. Not our doubt in evangelism in sharing with other people. What people need to see is the positive. And no, I'm not one of those positive preacher that says, if you do this, we need, you have the power to change, the power to believe, the power to... I only have the power that God has given me. Now, I'm not going to use that as an excuse not to do. Well, that's not my gift. That's not my talent. That's not my... My God is a big God, and He'll lead me. He'll enable me. He'll gift me to do that. Now, these attitudes, they're, they're, all, they're only a few of the attitudes that we display that, that I think drive people away from church. And it's that excuse that that's what church is. I don't want any part of it. I don't either. I don't come to church for church. I come to church because I'm a believer. I come to church to worship God. I come to church so that I can share the greatness of God. I come to church because I want to tell people God loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son for you. And that whosoever, you are the whosoever, put your name in there. The whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Don't come to a place for church. Come to a place to meet Jesus. Let God sort out all the sinners around you. Focus on yourself. And you know, if you think that's what church is about, go tell those people. I thought you were a believer. That'll rock their world. Someone comes up to you and says, well, I thought you were a believer. I am. Then how come you don't? Blah, 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 blah. And then get ready. God's going to do the same thing for you, to you. What makes us think he won't use someone here to get you straightened out ahead of time so he can continue to work through you? People don't want to be part of an attitude. Quite frankly, we're not a church with these attitudes, but we just become a place of convenience, a civic organization, something to think about. Jesus went to and hung out with prostitutes, tax collectors, fishermen, lepers, demon-possessed, rich, affluent. He went to some of the leaders and Nicodemus and is the only one we know that, that had anything to do with them. The people he ticked off the most were the church people. He hung out with the Syrophoenicians, with the Samaritans, with the sick, the lame, the deaf, the mute, and the dead. As a matter of fact, Jesus spent almost three-fourths of his ministry outside of Judah than he did in Judah and Jerusalem. Now, what does that tell us? 
You know what it tells me every time I, I read that, every time I write it, every time I preach it? I'm hanging out way too much with church people. I need to be hanging out with lost people. There are real people with real hurts, with real lostness, and they are going to a real hell for a real eternity because we have an attitude problem. Jesus got rid of the attitude. He went to the people, but the Jews would not. Seen on Facebook, the biggest reason people come to church, new people come to church. Are you ready for this? Because they're invited. Why are you here? Someone invited me. Someone invited me. That's what we should really be focusing on. Inviting people to church. At work. Ball games. School. Grocery store. Walmart. Lake. Vacation. Recreation. The alley. Taking out the trash. The doctor's office. The back fence. On the curb. On the road. At the gas pump. At the convenience store. In the restaurant, cafe. At the sale barn. The show barn. The hay barn. Whatever barn. We need to be, we need to be telling people about how great God is. Several years ago. When I mean several years, I'm going back to my first pastorate. My first pastorate in the Kansas City, Missouri area. Heard a guy make this comment about outreach. And he, see, he, he called it C, C, C. Continuous Christian contact. And what his philosophy was is he would share with anybody, anywhere, anytime. Simply by saying, you coming to church this Sunday? I was in church yesterday. I know, but are you going to come again this Sunday? Hey, where do you go to church at? I love using that line. You want to get someone really tongue-tied really quick? We can talk about last night's movie. We can talk about a book. We can talk about an, 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 an intimate relationship. We can talk about ball games. But let me tell you, when you mention church, people clam up and they cannot get away from you fast enough. I've about decided if there's someone around me I don't want to talk to, I'm just going to start talking about church. So, so if you call me and I go, hey, what do you think about church? You're going to go, oh, no, he doesn't want to talk to me. No. And this is on video. You know, what was your Sunday like? Tell people, hey, what's God done for you recently? Let me tell you what God did for me last week. Let me tell you what God did for me last month. Let me tell you what God's done for me this year. Let me tell you what God's done for me in my life. Where do you go to church? You don't go to church? Wow, we belong to, I belong to an awesome church. We got a Sunday school class that's just great. We really get into God's word. We got a preacher that, that actually he's better with the children than he is the adults because we all remember what the children was about before we remember the, 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 the adult part of the sermon that's there. Hey, we're just an old traditional church and our, and our music director sounds like Alan Jackson and his dad leads music on, on Sunday night and Wednesday night and we just sing the good old-fashioned hymns. I mean, the one your daddy and your granddaddy were raised on. There's nothing wrong with those songs in my book. Nothing at all. That's where we taught people doctrine. You look at them, and they look, you, you ask them, and they kind of look down and say, Hey, is there something wrong? Hey, is there something I can pray for you about? Pray with you, pray for you. Hey, do you mind right now if I just take a minute and pray with you? And then invite them to church. You know, I'm gonna, I, I, I promise you, we have these 30 day challenges everywhere. My land, Sean and Nikki, I saw Sean and Nikki Wednesday night, and they got this huge keg of water they're drinking. It's like a gallon, or it's half a gallon. They got to drink two of those a day. Lord, have mercy. I could drink it, but I, you better have a bathroom close. And not only that, I'm driving down the highway yesterday. I see two people running down the road. And I'm thinking, what in the world? It was Sean and Nikki. 
out jogging. They they left their house, ran to the corner, and were running back. And I thought, why run? You got perfectly good vehicles. <laughs> it's this challenge that they're on. Can I ask you, would you do the 30-day challenge with your attitude? If you're at home, would you would you consent and do the 30-day challenge with us? Would you take 30 days and give your attitude an adjustment? Would you take 30 days and do CCC, con Continuous Christian Contact? Would you make a commitment tonight or in your house this evening or whenever you're listening to this? Would you take the next 30 days and say, God, I'm going to do that. I'm going to talk to complete strangers. I'm going to talk to my best friends. I'm going to talk to my family. I'm going to talk to my schoolmates. I'm going to talk to my enemies. And I'm just going to ask them, how's life going? Hey, is there anything I can pray for you for? Hey, did you go to church this Sunday? Are you going? You didn't? Are you going to church anywhere? Would you want to come to church? I'll, I'll meet you. We have Sunday school at 930, and I'll be waiting in the sanctuary. Or I'll tell you what, church is at 1030. I'll meet you at 1020 out in the parking lot. I'll save a seat for you. I'd love for you to come to church and, and, and see. I've been to church. I've been to your little church before. Great. Would you want to come again? Would you want to help in Bible school? Okay, that might be over the board. But seriously, would you take the next 30 days? When you're at Walmart, ask the little clerk, hey, how you doing? Jill and I, when, when, when we would go out to eat for a while, we, we got into this habit. If we go out to eat, we look at the waitress and say, hey, we're going to pray for our few food in a few minutes. Anything we can pray for you about? And it's amazing the response we got sometimes. The way some of these waitresses, oh, they just opened up about things that were going on in their life. So would, would, would you be willing to take that challenge? You want to see God do something magnificent in your life? Would you like to see God do something magnificent in this church? Write it down. July 18th, 2021. Let's come back in, 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 in four and a half weeks and let's see what God's doing. Because we made the, the decision to do CCC. Continuous Christian contact, telling someone what God's doing in your life, what God's doing in your church, what God can do in their life. And you know, most of all, Jesus loves you. You know, we don't mind going up to someone who looks down and we say, you need a hug, and go give him a hug. When was the last time you said, maybe you just need some more Jesus? And some people you want to just shake and say, hey, you just need Jesus. But why not ask him that? Would you be willing to commit that? Would you be willing to take your attitude toward a new level? And don't be surprised if you see me if I do that to you. And if I don't, it's probably because I'm waiting to see if you're going to do it to me. So you can have a game, okay? You can beat F3 to the punch or F3, you can beat K to the punch. Don't ask her out in the parking lot. You go to church next Sunday, say, Lord, I haven't even left church this Sunday. <laughs> Let him get outside the church. But would you be willing... <laughs> Listen, it's okay to have fun as a Christian, but I'm serious about this. We have a lost world that's going to spend a real eternity in a real hell separated from a real God. And not because he wants them to. So we can make that little bit of time and that little bit of effort and make a whole lot of difference. Let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight and thank you. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to preach. I don't know what I'd do if I couldn't. And I thank you for the message that you've given me. I, there's no way I could dream this up, God. It's got to be from you. And because it's from you, you want us to use it. And I pray that we can take a 30-day challenge just to share with people about you, Jesus. Lead us as we go through this. Not on our own. Not by might, not by strength, but by my power. That's what we need. Holy Spirit power. Be with us as we leave here. Forgive us where we failed you in your name we pray. Amen. God bless you. See you Wednesday night.